Hello and welcome to Brilliant Britain. Today we're coming to you from the brilliant county of Cumbria. Cumbria. Today, we're hosting the show from Wastwater Lake, right in the heart of the Lake District. That's right, Chris. And did you know that back in 2007, this very spot was voted Britain's favourite view? We certainly are very lucky to be here. Did you know that Skullfell Pike, which is just over there, is England's tallest mountain? Well, did you know that this lake behind us is actually England's deepest? So, what are we having a fact off? Well, I'm just saying that there's brilliance all around us. When he's right, he's right. We're surrounded by a brilliant place. But what about the brilliant people of Cumbria as well? Let's take a look at the show we've got coming up. Josh was lucky enough to get a private concert from the incredible people at Sunbeams Music Trust. Chris discovered a disused mine in Egremont, which has undergone a spectacular transformation. And we signed up for the Cumbrian Dialect Competition at the annual IAB Music Festival. Remember, we want you at home to get involved with the Do Something Brilliant campaign. That's right, what we're asking you to do around the UK is do the little things that make a huge difference. For instance, me and Josh did something brilliant when we signed up to the IAB Festival's annual Cumbrian Dialect Competition. So you can prepare yourself to listen to Josh's pathetic excuse at a Cumbrian dialect. Yes, we were truly awful. I don't entirely agree. I think I did pretty well, actually. But we'll let the audience judge that later on. Meanwhile, let's go to Whitehaven on the west coast of Cumbria, where I was buzzing to meet some local beekeepers. Believe me, Josh, you don't want to miss this one. You were up all night writing those, weren't you? I can't help it. Hi, I've had a wonderful time. A bit nervous about what we're doing today. Am I right to be nervous? Not at all. We'll make sure that you've got a suit on and gloves and uh, the bees are very quiet here. They're not um, aggressive bees at all. I hope not. I hope not. I'm uh, quite scared <laughs> a suit actually. Here. We're going to go up to the bees but we'll get you into a suit first yep. and put some gloves on and then you can go a bit closer to them and uh, have a look at them and hopefully your nervousness will disappear. Bees have had a tough time recently. Um, there used to be a lot of beekeepers around and we used to go around as an association to their colonies, to their apiaries uh, and look at their bees and learn that way. But the bees have now become infested with something called the Varroa mite and this kills colonies. So we decided what we needed was a teaching apiary where we could teach new beekeepers and also teach ourselves the modern practices to keep bees healthy. We got a big lottery grant um, in 2011. We then realised that we needed some sort of garden to show people what bees need to eat because they need specific types of plants. Right, okay. And we then were lucky enough to get another big lottery fund and we are now in the process of planting it up with plants which are bee friendly. Should I get suited up now? I think you should. I yes, think I, I should think too. You need to get close to the bees and have a look at them. It's all one piece. They're like a boiler suit, really, with them, um, with a veil. Put, put your thumb through the loop. Through the loop. If you zip, the zip right up. And this is the veil, so that you can see what you're doing, but the bees can't actually get through it. Zip right round. I can hear them already. Yes, but we're at the back of the, uh, of the hive, so they go out the front, so we're fine here. Hello, Richard. How are you doing? You all right? Richard's our treasurer. OK, so straight away, I can see there's a number of these here. Uh, what's, the, what's the reason for that? Well, these are just all different colonies. OK. And the idea is that we use this as a teaching apiary to show people how to raise and look after bees. Excellent. So does each one have its own uh, queen that's yes. in there as well? Is yeah. that right? Yeah. And uh, is there any chance that we might see one? It's a possibility. So we can have a look inside and see what you think. Uh, will this anger them at all? Shouldn't do, no. We've given them a bit of a, a whiff of smoke on the, on the front. The smoke basically fills the bees into thinking there's a forest fire. 
Right. Um, and they'll go inside and start eating the honey that they've got in there to build up the stocks. Uh, basically preparing to leave the hive in case the hive catches fire. Okay. Um, and when they're full of honey, they're actually quite relaxed. Right. So okay. that's the idea behind it. So the first thing we need to do is make sure the queen isn't walking around on the top because we don't want to lose her. The male bees actually, um, apart from uh, mating with the queen, do nothing. They, they don't feed themselves, they don't collect nectar. They're fed by the worker bees. Okay. And what we do, we tend to look at the dark side first, which is the side that's in the darkness, because that's more likely where the queen's going to be. Okay. So what you can see on this one, we've got a lovely frame here. That's a, a drum there, the big, big bruiser there. Can't sting you. He doesn't have a sting. Oh, look. There she is. There's the queen, the one with the red marker on. Red blob on. We mark her early in the season. Would you like to take the next frame out? Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Let's do it. Okay, so quite heavy. Yep. So make sure you get hold them well at each side. So I've got this side here and yep. this side here. And just ease it up. Not gently, you don't want to brush them off either side. And then you can have a look and see what's going on. Do you reckon every third mouthful of food you eat is due to the bees pollinating? Because obviously without the pollinating the grasses, there's no grass for the, the cattle to eat, so you don't get any beef. Um, Without them pollinating the, the vegetable crops, etc., you don't get the vegetables, and the same with the fruits. Um, so, yeah, without the bees, we're in serious problems. Want to put that back in there? I, I really do. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you know, just place it back just, in here. Yeah, I don't want to. Carefully. So shall we go and have a look at the bee-friendly garden that we're developing? Sounds good to me. That's just this that's just over here, yeah? That's right, yes. OK. I'll take you down and um, introduce you to our landscape consultant. So I'm safe to take this off You're now as well, yeah? safe to take that off, yeah. Right, there we go. I can breathe now. Hiya. Hi. <laughs> this is Helen, Chris. Hiya, Helen. You all right? How are you doing? Yeah. Do you mind just telling us a little bit about what you do here? Yeah, Whitehaven Beekeepers asked me to come along and design a garden which um, would feed bees throughout the year. We're providing them with nectar and pollen um, and um, giving a place where they could bring school groups and community groups to source uh, plants for their own gardens to help bees in their own gardens and um, apiaries. It makes it quite a, a pleasant place to come as well as be, you know, really, really good for the bees. On the way in, we're in the Westlake Science and Technology Park. Um, how is it you came to get the area that you've got of this part of it? We asked um, Tim Hurst, who is the um, head of properties of um, Britain's um, Energy Coast Limited, and he rented us this patch of land for one jar of honey a year. One jar of honey a year. One jar of honey a year. It. And is that official? It is stipulated that it has to come from this apiary okay. and it is written into the contract. I'm not going to lie, Chris, you did not look comfortable there. You're right, I was completely out of my comfort zone. But the main thing is, is that I took part and I gave it a go. So what brilliant things have you been up to? Well, I think you'll find that I have quite a few things up my sleeve. Well, let's hear them. Well, good things come to those who wait, Chris. And I'm afraid you'll have to wait till after the break. Welcome back to part two of Brilliant Britain. As you can see, we're in the heart of the beautiful Lake District. And before the break, Josh promised us an example of the brilliant things that he's been up to. Yes, and as you know, Chris, brilliance comes in many different forms. I myself had the pleasure of spending an afternoon with Annie Mawson's Sunbeam Music Trust in my hometown of Kendal. Let's take a look. Sunny, tell me uh, why you started Sunbeam's music group then. Basically, I used to teach in a special school called Round Hills in Kendal, and I realised that I was helping children through music when no other strategies would work. I was teaching children who were elective mutes who didn't speak, but who would sing to raise this roof. 
And when the school closed, I started Sunbeams because all the parents were saying, Annie, please come and help. Um, they're struggling at mainstream and music was the way that helped everyone to communicate. We're from Sunbeams. We're from Sunbeams. Mighty, mighty Sunbeams. Mighty, mighty Sunbeams. And if they can't hear us, if they can't hear us, we have interactive music workshops throughout the whole county. We deliver community music therapy now in 43 projects like this one with over 10 graduate musicians to over 1,400 people every single month. We raise all the money ourselves. We believe we bring out potential in everyone. We look at the ability within the disability and we have great fun along the way. What does it feel like watching them go out onto such a big stage? Um, we're more frightened than they are, really. We're the sort of backing group to the divas, and they are just so amazing, and they thrive on an audience. Having said that, they would sing in front of nobody because they just love the power of music to heal. And we'll all go See, the reaction of people watching is fascinating because I think sometimes they're rather frightened of people with special needs and the audience gradually warms and instead of having a kind of fear in their eyes, they're suddenly part of us all and everybody is together in this wonderful sound that the Sunbeams troupe make. What's next for Sunbeams then? The next plan is, sadly, we have to write application after application <laughs> to try and get more funding to keep us going. But we have actually raised nearly £2 million separately to build our own Sunbeams Music Therapy Centre, which will serve not only just Cumbria, but the whole of England. Dave, how did you get involved in Sunbeams then? Uh, it was roughly about six years ago now. Uh, me and my wife stumbled across a concert at the Brewery Arts Centre in Kendall, part of the Lake District Music Arts Summer Festival. And uh, we just went in and stumbled across a fantastic concert by the Sunbeams troupe. It was just incredible what I actually witnessed in that Brewery Arts Centre. And um, after discussing it with my wife, we got in touch with Annie and she invited us along. But to be involved with these wonderful people, Annie and Michael and the troupe, is just so rewarding and we get so much out of it. Um, I'd recommend it to anybody. And these, these guys, these, uh, the people we work with, to see their faces and to hear them speak and, and gush about what they're doing and the music and the singing and see what rewards they get out of it means the world to us and uh, we wouldn't have it any other way. So Richard, um, how did you find out about Sunbeams then? Well, uh, I had a chat with one of the um, uh, guys that used to come around and do music therapy with me and, and he uh, recommended Sunbeams Music Trust to me, uh, so we, I gave it a shot and things just went on from there naturally really. I was like performing really and whether be in front of a crowd or just small gatherings or massive crowd like some mountain in the fields, I uh, just like it all really. So you've known Annie for quite a while then, how did you uh, meet Annie? I met her at Round Hills uh, quite a long time ago and I uh, joined Sunbeams and I went to London to play the harp. How long have you um, been in Sunbeams now then? I've been there for uh, quite a long time now, I enjoy it. Meeting new friends and getting to know people. For you, what's the most rewarding thing about this entire project? I think seeing the transformative effects that music has upon, upon every single person. Um, and then we have people who have severe dementia and Alzheimer's who have led amazing lives and they don't even know their own names. But when they sing, the whole world opens up for them and that is the reward.
got to hand it to you, Josh. That was pretty inspiring. It was. And as a Candalian myself, it was really nice to pop down and get involved. Another brilliant project from the Do Something Brilliant campaign. But before you go mad with the hashtag Something Brilliant tweets, it's time for our next project. We've been to some amazing places, but we can't do a show in Cumbria without at least talking about the mining heritage. Weren't most of the mines shut down years ago? Unfortunately, Josh, that is true. But I've found one hidden gem. Florence Mine in Egremont, where a group of truly talented and dedicated people have turned an old, disused ore mine into a community arts centre. Let's take a look. How important was the role of mining to the local area at the time it was used? Well, it was a, a, a large employer. There were 700 miners employed here. They were working on three shifts and it, it was a, a hive of activity, big industry. Well, we'll walk over to the entrance that we use for the work of the ore, which was down at shallow depth. And it's an incline going down at a gradient of one in four. So we're just we're on this incline now. Yeah, Chris, this is the incline that we put down to replace the shaft so that we could all uh, ore out of this incline and so that our men could get access into the mine workings. If I'm not back soon, send the search party. Formerly, the ore was used for to make into pig iron and then into steel. When they stopped making uh, pig iron and steel at Workington and at Millam, a small group of us got together to operate the mine to cater for the specialised steel industry uh, that was remaining in this country. Uh, I'm a bit nervous, I've been up this end, I've been down there. A little bit scary now, we're in daylight on ground level. Well, you wouldn't have made a very good miner then. No, <laughs> I definitely wouldn't. I definitely... <laughs> Uh, we've been to the pit head now and I feel a little bit safer in here now. Good. Uh, hopefully things won't change. Um, so do you mind just telling me um, what this building is and what it used to be? This used to be the shower block when the miners came out absolutely covered in iron ore, red dust. Uh, they would come in, in here to get showered uh, before heading home. Okay. And um, do you mind just telling us what it is that... what it is now? Well, once the mine closed and uh, the sort of historic part of it finished, um, it was decided to turn it into an art centre for the benefit of the community. And uh, so over the last couple of years, it's been sort of converted, a few walls put up, a new floor, that yeah. sort of thing. And we've now got an art centre with um, artists in, in residence here. We've got studio, music room, gallery, a uh, bit of a cafe area, uh, reception area. That's where we are just now. Yeah, um, so it's a venue where artists and uh, people can meet up to um, do whatever they want to do. Could you just tell us a bit about the links between the mine and the projects being used now? Well, it, it's quite interesting because uh, the iron ore mine is no longer mined, it, it's, but the iron ore is lying around on the ground and uh, a group of paint makers have got together and have started using that iron ore to make uh, paint and pastel um, so it's still being used today in the sense uh, for its original purpose of the iron ore. So if you come through here, we enter the gallery and uh, this is a huge sort of lovely space for artists and photographers. It changes every six weeks and um, this one is about lonnings, which is a Cumbrian dialect word for, well it, it means lane, a country lane or footpath. And that explains why I can see all these all these different uh, the room, country right? lanes. Well it, it's interesting because most of the lonnings have peculiar names. So there's Primrose Lonning, Johnny Bulldog Lonning, <laughs> Dynamite Lonning, uh, Fat Lonning and Thin Lonning and even a Squeezed Gut Lonning which is extremely thin. And we just sent our photographers and artists out there to record them and to celebrate them and to let other people know about them. Hello there, Hello. Chris. How are you doing? Good, thank you. So we're in the Paintmaker studio now. We are. And uh, it goes on a little bit further down there, but uh, what, what's some of the things around me here? This is our range of paints that we've been making over the past couple of years or so. So here we've got oil paint, 
we've got watercolour and we've got our new pastels. Behind is the iron ore. That is artist quality pigment, but it's the rich red hematite from Florence Mine. This is an example of our hematite powder. And at the end of the last century, the 19th century, it was like the Klondike here. It was so busy with the iron ore, it was in such high demand. Mm -hmm. And if you go to New York, for example, or to Washington, the Smithsonian, you'll actually see examples of West Cumbria iron ore because wow. it was so highly valued. And it's fantastic that today we're still realizing its potential as a fantastic product. Wow, it's really amazing how they've turned an old mine into a community hub. It really is, and it's truly for a worthwhile cause as well. Although I didn't really like going down that mine too much. <laughs> I wish you'd stayed there. <laughs> Thanks a lot, mate. Well, as I try to build some bridges with Chris, we'll take a break. Welcome back to the final instalment of Brilliant Britain. We're here in Cumbria, celebrating some of the truly brilliant things in our county. But the brilliant shouldn't stop there. Remember to tell us about all the things that you're doing around your local community. Visit the website dosomethingbrilliant.co.uk for inspiration. And if you're already inspired, tell us all about it with the hashtag somethingbrilliant. Now, it's the time that we've all been waiting for. It's the IAB Music Festival, which is home to the annual Cumbrian dialect competition, which we took part in. It all started 12 years ago in the garden of a local resident, and now is an annual festival which attracts hundreds of people from all over the world. And for the past two years, this has been home to the dialect competition. So prepare for some spectacular fails. From him, of course. Before we relive that embarrassment, let's take a look at the IAB Music Festival and find out what makes it so unique. I had my 50th and had a big garden party and a friend who came who lives in the village said oh this would be a brilliant place to have a music festival we thought yeah so next year we had a music festival 70 people came along and and it's grown from then. How many people do you expect now? Uh, we've sold 600 tickets so we've sold out so we're still relatively a small uh, festival but there will probably be about 800 people here tomorrow. So how does it actually impact on the community in a whole, do you think? Well, I think it brings us all together. We've got committee members from and people who help out, a steward, from basically 8 to 80. It, it generally, I think it's just somewhere where everybody has their own role. But I think one of the most important aspects of it is um, it's a showcase for local talent. What do you think it is about this festival that makes it stand out from other festivals? I think you just got to look around and just see that it's pretty relaxed, you know. Um, there's no hard and fast rules. As long as you've got your wristband, you've paid your money, you can come in. And it's a family festival. Uh, uh, just, just in front of us here, there's um, uh, a children's workshop going on, a, a storytelling. And it's gone from a back garden scene to a brilliant sort of, you know, panoramic scene here on, on the uh, uh, northwestern edge of the Lake District, yeah. So, Flats and Sharps, how did that name come about? One story is that we just typed in music into Google and we picked the first ring that came up. If you type in Sharps and Flats, we're still the first ring that comes up. I'm awful proud of that, awful proud of that. So here's a song to put you in a good mood, and it's a song about death. <laughs> How did we find out about this place? Uh, we got asked, we just got asked to play yeah. off the blue, but we thought, hey, that looks fun, it's over the bridge, let's do it. We've had, we've had a lovely time. Uh, thank, thank you for coming in and seeing all your beautiful, beautiful faces here. Um, we'd love to meet you and talk to you because we are rather sociable creatures. With these little festivals, the most beautiful thing about it is the lovely people. You get such a sense of community here after a while. I mean, it's the first time we've been here, but already there's, there's just some people, such lovely vibrations going on. And you just, you just after the end of the weekend, it's, it's really sucks to go back to reality. We're, we're Flats and Sharps, you've been lovely. Here's a song called The White House Blues. 
So here we are in front of the Story Dome at the IB Music Festival. So would you mind just telling me what your name is and what you do? My name is Ian Douglas and I'm a storyteller. Do you know what leprechauns have? Golden wishes. So he picked up the little man, he said, Oi, yo, give me your wishes. So the little man went in his pocket and he pulled out three little wishes and the man took them and he went home to his wife who was on the doorstep and she was smiling like that. So what is it that um, makes you want to come back as well from here from the first time that you did it? i tell you what, I've been up and down the country, I've been left and right and I have never been to a festival. It might be small, but there's nothing like the family feel. I'm taking part in a, a Cumbrian dialect competition later on. Well, you're not Cumbrian, are you? I am, are you? I am. Where I've, are you I've, from? Carlisle. Do you know any Cumbrian dialect that I can just get a little bit of a leg up in the competition? Hasta ever... Hold on. Hasta ever send a cuddy leper five bar gat. Eh, there you go. That's the only Cumbrian I know. And what does it mean? Hasta ever send a cuddy leper five bar... Have you ever seen a sheep jump over a five bar fence? I'm a Yorkshireman, so I know no Cumbrian. Is, that's Cumbrian though, isn't that's, it? But that's Cumbrian, yeah. Has to ever send a... Has to ever send a cuddy la pa fa ba ga. Has to... Has to ever send a cuddy... What was the next line? Leper five ba gat. Leper five ba gat. <laughs> I didn't know. I, I, I don't know. That's it. Yes. There you right. go. You're going to win. Yeah. I've got, got great... I'm putting money on you. I've got it. Brilliant. Thanks very much. It's all right, my man. Oh, cheers. This is the... Lakeland dialect competition, part of the festival. People can come up to the front, say their name, say what their piece is. This is a self penned poem called Adverts. You get your empty work and you have a wish, you get some supper inside your belly, you get sat down in a doll down chair and think, I wonder if there's out on telly. Owns a fettle, Egglesfield. Wedding's the night. The time Steg got to do her, Joan was 30 yards down the road, going at a trot. I apologise to each and every one of you. Um, I am from Cumbria. Kendall Burton will not believe me after this. While they were out, a la lass Cal Godlocks was having a walk through towards to slamming time. And when she come across to cottage, so very soon she ate, <laughs> ate it all, leaving to basin with Newt. <laughs> James. My apologies for him, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm here to raise the bar back up. Let's do it. <clears throat> you may brag o' your German, French, Latin and Greek and all other languages mortals can speak. Yet there is not Jan at fower of mentioning ad can bang. It were bonny old canny old Cumberland twang. And now for the secret weapon that I've been working on for quite a while now. <clears throat> Have you ever seen a cuddy lauper five bar yacht? <laughs> and in first, Dick Garger. Yes. Watching the telly. Do you think we have a future in this? Oh, yeah, should we, should we well, if, if you could get if you could get a bit of inspiration and, 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 and sort of write something of your own, I think we can. Next time, yeah, definitely. Commit, we're coming for your title. Yeah. Oh, uh, we well, congratulations again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we're at the end of the show now. We've seen everything from mines to mountains, and now for some more music. That's right. Today we're being played out by the Elaine Davidson Trio, who we were lucky enough to see at the IOB Festival. But for now, it's a bye from us and a ta from Cumbria. Trust that the love in your heart is more real than kingdoms, castles, fortunes conceal. Gentle the hour she comes to reveal. Mysteries bright, moon and tide. My heart is an ocean, begging to live. My heart is an ocean, not yours to keep.